that'll help him. Okay, we are in the book of John today. So if you will open up your Bibles, if you have them, or your devices, or wait for it to be projected on the screen, we are in the book of John chapter 20 today, the last half of the chapter. After um, Jesus, it has been discovered that Jesus has been taken from the tomb. Now, he showed up, according to the book of John, to Mary Magdalene. We saw that last week in an amazing encounter with Jesus. From the other Gospels, we also know as the other women left from the tomb, when Mary Magdalene was not with them, she had run to tell the disciples, Jesus also met them. We're told later on in 1 Corinthians 15 that during the day, he also appeared to Peter, but we know nothing about that. We just know that he appeared to Peter. And um, now, today, he's going to appear to all the disciples, well, 10 of them. And, of course, Judas is gone, and Thomas just wasn't there. He was off doing whatever he was doing. And so, but the 10 of them are there. And so today we're going to look at um, the promises that God or Jesus was releasing to the disciples. I've just entitled this Receiving the Promises because when Jesus showed up and said, hey, I'm alive, he didn't just say, hey, I'm alive and disappear again, pop in and pop out. He unleashed some promises that were, it changed everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Um, and I've already set up the fact that, you know, that Mary Magdalene was greeted by Jesus, but, and then a few other people, but the disciples as a whole had not yet seen him. And it says, now, then when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were closed where the disciples were for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he said this, he showed his hands and his side to them. Okay, so there gathered together in a room. It is Sunday evening. It is after a very eventful day, a lot of confusion, a lot of reports. And uh, the point when he shows up, you understand, if you look at the book of Luke, it's right after the Emmaus disciples get there. The Emmaus disciples are the ones that are on their way to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up and walks with them. And then when they get to the house, he breaks bread. They recognize him. They immediately get up and head back to Jerusalem. It's a it's pretty good chance it's a husband and wife. And they, are, they head back to Jerusalem. They get to the disciples, and they say, we have seen the Lord. They said, yeah, we've shown, he showed up to so-and-so. And, 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 and uh, then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in their midst. So this is right after the Emmaus disciples had gotten there. And it says that as they were gathered together for fear of the Jewish people, they had locked doors. Let's just rephrase that. They had doors that were barred and bolted because they were afraid that someone would break in and arrest them. They were probably gathered together because they were thinking, how are we going to get out of the city without being captured, without being arrested and taken prisoner by the Jewish leaders who certainly are interested in our whereabouts? And so all of a sudden, right in their midst, as they are gathered together for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus shows up. Probably just said, Shalom, peace be with you. Um, and they needed, to, they needed some reassurance. <laughs> he released peace to them and uh, said, showed them his hands and his feet. I can imagine they were a little jumpy. Can you imagine the entire place is locked up? These are the guys that when they were in the boat on the sea and Jesus came walking out to them on the water, they were terrified because they thought it was a spirit walking on the water. They were terrified. We'd say ghost, you know, that this is some spirit walking on the water. And they're shouting out in fear. So you think that they get over primal emotional issues like that quickly? After they have just gone through the emotional horrors that they've gone through over the last couple of days? I can imagine if all of a sudden you're in a room together and 
you know this happens to you. If you don't know someone's in a room and all of a sudden they move, and let's say you walk into a bedroom or a whatever room and you're in there and you didn't know that your spouse was there or that someone else was there and they suddenly say, oh, hello. You know, you might jump. Now, you multiply at times the lack of sleep and the emotions and everything that they had going on. There's a pretty good chance there was some yelling going on. Whoa! And Jesus says, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. Because his hands, of course, had nail marks. And it was probably right here. Hands incorporate any of this area. If, if, he had, if you nail through someone's palms, it'll pull through. So this area it won't because there's so much bone. But, um, and then he, the side that he had been pierced up into the heart. And we assume it was this side, but who knows? Right? It doesn't say. And so, but he was proving through who he was through the wounds. And uh, Luke 24 adds these details. But they were alarmed and very frightened. They thought they were seeing a spirit. Same thing. He said to them, why are you distressed and why do questions spring up in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet, for I myself am here. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Because they were so filled with joy and amazement, they had difficult believing. He said to them, do you have any food here? They gave him a piece of roasted fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Can you imagine? This is like show and tell. Okay. <laughs> he's trying to get them to believe it's him. And he's not just some spirit. It's a resurrected body. He had been resurrected. And so he says, hey, touch, touch. Okay. And they're going, I still don't believe it. He said, fish, please. Food, please. And he, and he ate in front of them. Because you've got to figure a spirit is not going to you know, eat, right? You all seen the movies where if a spirit tries to eat it, just uh, you drink something, it goes right out on the floor. It just makes a mess. You just don't want to. Okay, John chapter 20, second half of the ver verse 20. Then when they saw the Lord, the disciples rejoiced. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you, just as the Father sent me, I'm also sending you. He just gets them under control and he puts them on their mission. Think about that. He, he doesn't waste a lot of time. Their unbelief, their fear, their distress turned to joy because they thought it really is him. This is amazing. And uh, they were excited about that. And then um, he said, peace be with you because he was about to send them on their mission. It was like he takes up where he left off. You know, he said, you know, you're going to be sent out and you're apostles and you've got this mission to do. And he made sure they were well trained. And then he has this crucifixion thing happen and the resurrection. And he shows up again, and says, OK, w what I was saying, where I left off. And begins to say, now you are on your way. And uh, he, of course, sent them with power for the mission. He was helping them out. Uh, John 14, 12 to 14, he had said this to them. I'm telling you the very truth. The one who believes in me will also do the works I am doing. He will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Then whatever you ask in my name, this I will do in order that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And he'd already been prepping them with that, saying, listen, this is, your prayers are going to have power. You go out on your mission, you're going to change the world. They'd already practice. He had sent them out, two by two, the apostles. Then he had sent them out, the 72. And he made sure that they had the practice they needed to change the world, because that's what they were going to need to do. After he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they have been forgiven them. If you hold anyone's sins against them, they have been held. Now, this is a pretty interesting scripture. It's certainly, um, this, is, uh, this is where the church started. Now, I know there's, there, there is a reference in the book of Acts to the church in the Old Testament that was with Moses in the wilderness, but the word church just means gathering or assembly, the ecclesia, gathering or assembly. In the New Testament, it takes on the technical term of the called out people of God. 
because we have been called out of darkness, as Peter says, into his marvelous light. And so it becomes much more of a technical term in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was just assembly. We're never told that Israel was a, if you will, technical term, assembly or church. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the church is formed right here. He breathed on them. I want you to think about it a minute. Let's just say, does this echo anything? Huh, let me think. Oh, yeah, the creation of the world. Yeah. And then he formed Adam. And he breathed into him. By the way, the Greek here could be translated, he breathed in them. Okay. And they certainly, the breathing on them, they breathed in. Okay. This is a recreation event. The world was changing. Well, what happened? Okay, back in the Garden of Eden, God breathed into them the breath of life. They were spiritually alive. They were filled with God's Spirit. But there was a death event. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Or dying, you will die is a really literal way of saying it. And um, on the day they ate... And ignores God, ignored God's command, they died spiritually. The spirit that had been in them and a part of them, gone. Now, we take it for granted when we come to faith in Christ that the spirit takes up residence in us. That is a New Testament phenomena. That was not an Old Covenant phenomena. That is our thing since Jesus won it. And when he breathed on them, I don't think there's any more obvious way he could have been saying, I'm restoring into you what was lost at the fall. Luke 44 says it, or 24 says it this way, starting with verse 44. Then he said to them, this was my message that I told you while I was wet, w yet with you, that it was necessary that everything written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He breathed into them the spirit. Their spirit became alive and it gave them understanding of the scriptures. A very power. This changed everything. This was an epoch changing event. This night, Resurrection Sunday, started out with the world being changed and death being defeated. Sin, death, and the devil no longer held uh, hegemony over the world. And by the night, Jesus had restored the spirit into the human soul. What an amazing, the, the, the Holy Spirit, what an amazing day that was. You know, we celebrate Pentecost because Pentecost was the empowering of the church, but this was the founding and recreation of what God had intended at the Garden of Eden. Now we take the Holy Spirit for granted once we're saved. We talk about, you know, we understand what conviction is through the Holy Spirit. We also understand what, you know, condemnation is from the voice of Satan. You know, I mean, there's two differences. You've got to get really good at listening. Which one has the authenticity of God? But because um, we pick up airwaves all around us, a lot of the thoughts you have are not your thoughts. You're just picking up the garbage from the demonic realm in, in your head. And so you've got to realize that. Sometimes you probably think to yourself, how could I have had such a horrible thought? It wasn't your thought. It'll become your thought if you nurture it. Don't nurture him. Dismiss him. I rebuke that thought in Jesus' name. That's taking every thought captive, which is what the Apostle Paul says. So Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the Scripture, and the new covenant was initiated. That is what happened. And uh, in uh, Ezekiel 36, 24 to 27, there's this promise. Then I will take you from the nations and I will gather you from all the lands and bring you into your land. Then I will sprinkle clean waters on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurity and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. That's what the Holy Spirit brings is a new heart. 
and I'll give you a new spirit. I will remove the heart of stone from within you and give you a heart of flesh. And that just means a soft heart. Our, when we talk about flesh, we often think of the negative stuff in our lives. But this just means a soft heart. Where they had hearts of stone, knock, 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 it'd be something that is actually sensitive to God. I will bestow my spirit among you, and I will work so that you walk in my statutes and keep my uh, judgments and do them. And then in Jeremiah, look, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Covenants were always cut. It will not be like the covenant that I cut with their fathers in the day when I firmly held them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. They broke my covenant even though I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. For this is the covenant I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law on them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And a man will never again teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and will never again remember their sin. These are the promises that were being fulfilled when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, because now the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. That's what Jesus had said to the disciples. He will be your teacher. And he breathed into them so that they would demonstrate that. By the way, for those of you who don't normally see Bible translations with the word Yahweh in it, that's the Tetragrammaton. In your Bible translations, it's spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's just the name of Yahweh by which he revealed himself to us. And uh, not one we're really used to saying, but it's actually in the Bible. It's Yahweh. Every time you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's Yahweh. And God's identifying himself as Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh. But because of Jewish convention, they did not want to pronounce his name, so they decided to pronounce it Adonai every time they saw it. And eventually in English translations and other translations, they made an alternate way of saying his name so you wouldn't call him by his name, Yahweh. I uh, obviously, as I translate, do not hold to that convention. I think if God revealed his name to us, we need to know it. Okay, so that's my theology. Um, anyway, so the new covenant, the new creation was initiated. It was fulfilling the promises of the uh, first covenant that had been given. And then he says this, if you forgive anyone their sins, they have been forgiven them. If you hold anyone's sins against them, they have been held. In a sense, he's explaining or expanding the authority of the keys, Remember, he's already said to them, when the church comes into play, you're going to have keys of authority that lock and unlock doors. You know, we're having our Morning Star Fellowship of Ministries uh, retreat coming up very quickly, and the theme is unlocking the doors. That's because God, in a very clear way, has been speaking about that. And our job is to use the keys to unlock or to lock, you know, unlock the things God wants released, lock the things that he doesn't want released. The other way to say that is to bind or to loose or to, um, well, there's a lot of different ways you could say it. Just making sure that we understand you can release things or you can stop things. Okay, forbid and release, permit. So this is the authority of the keys expanded. If you remember from Matthew chapter 16, Simon Peter uh, responded and said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responded to him and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in the heavens. I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build, that's future, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens, and whatever you might lock on the earth, it will be stay locked in the heavens, and whatever you might unlock on the earth, it will stay unlocked in the heavens. That's the authority of the keys, uh, a major part of the little book that I wrote on authority over hurricanes, 
develops the authority of the keys so you understand exactly what it is that God has been given to us. In Matthew 18, the same authority is spoken about in the context of trying to redeem a brother or sister who has caused offense. If your brother wrongs you, go expose his wrong between you and him alone. If he should hear you, you have avoided losing your brother. The goal is restoration of the relationship. But if he does not hear you, take with you one or two others again, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is verified. Then if he pays no attention to them, speak to the church. And if he also pays no attention to the church, let him be like a Gentile or a tax collector to you. I tell you the truth, whatever you lock on the earth will stay locked in the heaven, and whatever you unlock upon the earth, it will stay unlocked in the heavens. And so the power of the keys is even spoken about when the church gathers together to say, hey, this person has stepped into a major amount of sin, and it's hurtful to the relationship in the body of Christ. Remember when the Apostle Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, when there was that guy who was uh, having an immoral sexual affair in a way that the pagans didn't even did, he said, when I am there in spirit with you and you're gathered together in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you hand this man over to Satan. That's locking the door. So that, because you're taking away all the protection that he has through the church. And he says, y you're doing this so that his soul will be saved on the last day. Because Paul was so concerned that the man was hardened in his sin, he needed a shock to the heart. Basically, it's walking over to the defibrillator, like we have on the wall over there. It's opening the case, pulling the thing out, getting the paddles out, and going, boom! Why? Because we take for granted the protection that we have in the church. And when we hand someone over or lock the door, if you will, to the protection that we enjoy as God's people, and we say for the purposes of this person's soul, they need to find out Satan is a harsh taskmaster. If we take God's protection away from them, that person's going to find out, maybe I should stick with God. And that was Paul's whole point. And, and of course, we know from 2 Corinthians, or we believe from 2 Corinthians, that the man did repent. So that is the goal. Here, if you hold anyone's sins, just gets a little more specific. Obviously, Matthew 18 was talking about that. The guy was in sin. He had violated something against a brother or sister. And now he just simply says, if you forgive anyone their sins, they've been forgiven them. If you hold anyone's sins against them, they have been held. And, and that is, um, let's just say, uh, just a real quick example. Someone in our church does something really egregiously wrong. Okay, I'm just really awful. And they are, you know, obviously, um, there's all sorts of consequences that can happen when you do that. And we have the authority of the church when the person is repentant to say, Lord, do not hold this against them. We unlock forgiveness. We don't hold it against them. None of the blessings of the kingdom are lifted from them. They may have to pay a, a burden in society if they've done something, okay? But... None of the blessings of the kingdom are withheld from them. On the other hand, if the person is absolutely impenitent, then you have to go the other place. Exactly what Paul told them to do in 1 Corinthians 5. But that's the authority of the church. We're taking away protection or we're reaffirming the protection, and we have the authority to do it, which means when we do it, it's real. It's not a church function. It's not one of those things that... Uh, a, uh, you know, a priestly figure can just suddenly do or impose on someone who's a true believer. It's about sin. It's about egregious sin. You don't do this with people who have a theological difference with you. That's what they used to do down through the ages. Back in 1096, when the, uh, Easter, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Christians, uh, separated from the Western Christians, they excommunicated each other, put each other under the ban. You know, and that, by the way, means they're holding their sins against them, and basically shutting heaven was in their mindset. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I don't believe that we have that ability. I believe we have the ability to take an umbrella of protection off people or to put it back into place. But obviously our eternal destination is always up to Jesus. So, um, you know, in his relationship with the individual. So we don't get into the ban thing, but we do have authority, and we don't use it that much because we, generally speaking, don't have those issues today. I mean, it's just not, it's not, uh, people today, when they get into stupidity, they go someplace else quick. 
I mean, you understand, it just, it's just the way it is, you know. Uh, people will go disappear and they'll show up in another congregation that doesn't know their background. And God forbid that that pastor or that congregation doesn't make a phone call. It's their fault what they're about to reap, you know, because they just don't know. And um, they, because it's, it's, it's brotherly and sisterly respect. And by the way, and this is just, I don't do this all the time. Because sometimes I don't find out where people have come from. But if I find out, I just say, hey, can I make a phone call to your previous church so I just make sure it's okay with them? I want to make sure they understand I'm not trying to steal you. It's your desire to be here, blah, blah, blah. Because we don't need that tension in the body of Christ where people think that you're out to steal their sheep. So that's not one of the things we want to do. So anyway, now we, we learn... We've learned a lot. This all this has all happened. The church is being initiated. Jesus said, I'm going to give you these keys. Now he's saying, I've given them to you. Why? You're the church. And the church uses these keys, and we've been using them ever since, or we should be using them. But Thomas, one from among the twelve who was called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he kept saying back, unless I see his hands in the nail wounds and put my finger in the nail wounds and put my hands into his side, I will never believe. Okay, that is a statement of flat out. Now, by the way, I call him Thomas the loyal, not doubting Thomas, because he's the one that looked at the disciples when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and said, let us go that we may die with him. That's loyalty. And he was in deep depression, clearly. He was certainly in a place of doubting Jesus' resurrection. But I don't think that one bad weekend, or week, really, um, should tar someone's reputation for uh, your entire life. Do you? You better hope to God not, right? Because sometimes we have bad weeks, you know, and all of a sudden, oh, man, if you're fasting, you're just going to be ugly sometimes, you know, if you're doing... Whatever, you know, you, you've, you've been to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you need to make sure that you just don't do this, this, or this, or this. And you go, what? And uh, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Anyway, the, uh, so I, I think he, he had this problem. It was because he, he really wanted to be true, but he, for, he was afraid it was a false hope and he wasn't going to be deluded along with them. He maybe thought that they had an ecstatic experience, they had a vision, whatever, but that it wasn't this. So he says, hey, unless I see his hands and his feet, unless I'm able to actually do this, well, this, or put my hand in his side, that's not going to happen. By the way, I translated it twin. You know, Thomas the twin, also called twin. Why? Because that's English. Most translations will translate it, translate it Didymus, which is not English. I'm translating from one language into another. The word means twin. Okay, just want to point out why I did it that way instead of Didymus. Then after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were shut, shut Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and take your hand and place it in my side. Stop being faithless, but believe. Okay. Eight days later, they always counted like they would count Sundays one, two, so it's the next Sunday. They're all gathered together, yet they now weren't leaving Jerusalem. They were staying in Jerusalem because Jesus said, you stay in Jerusalem. He told them that in Acts, but he also had been saying it the whole time. And uh, so they're there after eight days. Thomas was with them this time. They're still prob they probably were at dinner, and he was saying, Thomas, he really is risen. He says, I told you what it's going to require. And uh, they're saying, what a stubborn twin. And uh, even though the doors were shut, again, locked, bolted, Jesus came and stood among them, said the same thing, shalom, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Do exact. Now, by the way, that means Thomas was being told, I know what you said. I know what you've been saying all week. So here, I'm here so you can do this. But then he... he <laughs> He's dealing with Thomas's words, but then he says this really pointed thing at the end. Stop being faithless. That's pretty strong language. 
You understand we walk, Paul said this, and it said it in Haggai, we walk from in f- faith from first to last. It's faith is our walk. And Jesus is saying, I'm telling you, you ignored the women, you ignored Peter, you ignored um, the uh, other reports of me, you ignored all of these things. All the, the ten disciples that were there last week, you're ignoring everybody's testimony. I, by the way, what, what is it in the Old Testament on the testimony of uh, two or three witnesses? Every word will be established. Let me see. You've got 10, 11, 12, about 17 to 20 witnesses. And you have refused to listen to them. That's faithlessness. That's why Jesus is confining him. Stop being faithless, but believe. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, it is only because you have seen me that you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen me, but have believed. Now, this is really fun, what Thomas says, okay? It's obvious. By the way, whenever you get one of those guys knocking at your doors and they say, you know, Jesus wasn't the son of God. He wasn't true God. And you say, well, then Thomas was wrong. And they'll have some answer to that. Well, yes, he was. Jesus didn't correct him. If someone ever calls you an honorific of some sort and you haven't earned the honorific, what do you do? You correct them. Otherwise, you've got stolen valor. You correct them. If you're in the military and you're a sergeant and someone calls you captain or something else, you correct them. You you say, no, 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 I'm only... okay." Um, it's the way it is. I mean, I, as, as chaplain for the, Coral, uh, the Veterans Coalition of Coral Springs, um, a lot of people, because I'm wearing the shirt and I'm a chaplain, but I've never served, um, a lot of people will say, thank you for serving. And I would say, well, no, I'm just the chaplain. And finally, they took me aside and said, listen, you're serving us now. You are serving. Don't correct them. Just say thank you. Okay. <laughs> But I was so sensitive to the idea that I don't want stolen valor. I don't want people to think that I served and put my life on the line in the same way that the veterans have. That'd be inappropriate. And what they told me is, don't be rude to people. You know, they're just thanking us all because of the shirt. Okay, okay. (laughs) You're not receiving personal affirmation. It's a collective thing for the entire coalition. I said, okay, okay. I can handle that. But Jesus didn't correct him. Now, if someone came up to you and said, hey, man, you're awesome. You're right up there with God. I think you would duck. You would say, whoa, 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 I'm stepping backwards out of the way as a lightning now. Remember, Herod, this is the voice of a God, not a man. He's instantly struck with worms. They eat him from the inside out because he didn't give glory to God. Anyone ever calls you something like that? You go, no, 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 that's not me. (laughs) Because we don't do that. Jesus did not rebuke him because it's true. Thomas goes, my Lord and my God. Now, the word Lord, the Greek word is curious, but we've got a very interesting, (laughs) it's curious, yeah. That's, that's really the, the Greek word. Um, but it's, uh, it's not just curious, it's curious. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Greek word, because remember, they often spoke in Aramaic, you know, especially when they were together alone, and these were all Galileans, and they're going to talk in Aramaic. They're not going to necessarily speak in Greek when they're with each other. So we say, what? I wonder what he said. Now, he could have been speaking Greek, so you can't push this too far, but if he said, curious, um, that was a word which was used in the Old Testament when the Greek, when the Old Testament Hebrew was translated into Greek, Adonai was translated curious, and so was Yahweh. So, I mean, you understand. That's why I've got both of them up there. It could just mean sir also or Lord, you know, in the sense of sir, master. Um, But I think it's got far more, because especially because he says my God. There's no mistake in what he means there. God is God. So I'm wondering, one of the major expressions of the Old Testament is Lord God. You see that all the time in the Old Testament. And it's, it's Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh is God's name. 
Lord God. And the Greek language, it would be Kyrios Elohim, or uh, Theos, which means God. Um, so he may have been saying in the first, not just sir, but he was saying, he may have been saying Adonai. And uh, that would have been something, you know, or uh, Yahweh. That, that more, to me, I, I lean toward that, no way to prove it, because all we have is the Greek translation. So. Um, and any, by the way, Aramaic translations are uh, uh, taken from the Greek. Whenever someone says, you really, should, you really should have a Bible translation that's been translated from the Aramaic, that they sell that all the time, by the way. You can, you can get a Bible translation that was translated from the Aramaic, which means what you're doing is you're taking a Bible translation, which was translated from, in the New Testament at least, from Greek into Aramaic, and then Aramaic into English. Every step you lose original meaning, which means it's a far less accurate translation. But you can buy it if you want. Feel free. It just doesn't do anything. It's less accurate than one that's been translated from Greek into English uh, or Hebrew into English. Because, again, they say Ar Hebrew into Aramaic into, you know, whatever. And uh, just not, doesn't work real well. Okay. He says, my God, which means my God. He's saying Jesus is the Son of God, God incarnate, which we know from the you know, the, uh, uh, his incarnation as a little child, that's not even a question. But again, when you've got those people knocking at your door saying, I don't think the Bible ever says that Jesus is true God. Well, Thomas seems to be, uh, what? Uh, what? What was he again? Oh, he was an apostle. And the church is built on the what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so what I'm telling you, I usually say don't argue with the people at the door. They're just deceived, and you're not going to move them. Honestly, I'm telling you that. Um, I have a friend up in Wisconsin who for the last 20 years has been arguing with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he's a pastor, and he's trained in the same seminary I was, which means he has the Greek skills and the Hebrew skills. And he's a studious guy, and he's, he would always send back to me these arguments that they were having. I says, you, you are wasting your time. This guy, just every time you, he responds, he looks for an angle. You have presented the truth to him over and over and over again, and he's just looking for weasel ways out of the truth. Don't do this. No kidding. Last month, he sent me another one. And the question was, should I respond? And I said, no, no, please, no. Save your sanity. <laughs> what a waste of time. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, if someone knocks at your door and you say this, it's, like I said, it's just, you know, I usually go after the Greek, which they don't know how to respond to, which is good. Um, anyway, Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen me but have believed. Okay, that's pretty important. There's something about believing without seeing that confers a greater blessing. I want you to hear that again. Pay attention. There's something about believing without seeing that confers a greater blessing. Sometimes we say, well, Lord, all I want to do is see an angel. Do you believe in angels? There's something about believing without seeing that confers a greater blessing. Okay, I'm just saying, okay, I, there's, you know, and, and, and if it's part of your calling to see angels, you will. And it's wonderful to see angels. I'm always expecting them to show up and go, boo! Okay, and then, you know, it doesn't matter if they say boo or not. That's how you're going to feel. Okay, and they won't say boo. Okay, but um, that's, <laughs> we had some interesting thing happens in our house once in a while, and I know the, the instant result. Um, but anyway. The, uh, there's a greater level of blessing. And so if you aren't getting angelic visitations at your work, sometimes people say, well, you should all be expecting angelic invitation, visitations. Yeah, but also you don't need them. You do not need them. You've got, to rela you've got the Holy Spirit living in you. Okay? You don't need them. The Apostle Peter said, we have the word of God made more certain in the written word than even his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. He had God the Father there. He had Moses and Elijah. 
And he says the word of God that we have, which works in our heart, is more certain than that vision. That's, okay, that's what we're at, too. And, and again, maybe you're calling to have an angelic visitation. That's great. Um, you may have dreams and everything, you know, whatever. That's great. Feel free. We're, we're prophetic people. This is God's, but, but we don't need it unless it's a part of our calling, and we absolutely do need it. Now, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so that by believing you may possess life in his name. This is John's focus. By the way, we're not done. It sounds like we're done. I think he was writing to finish the book, and then he realized, oops, I should add something else. Okay, to the uh, fishing story. So we've got John's focus is the miracles of Jesus and the purpose for the miracles. And he says, I, there's so much I could have written, but it, I, I really want you to believe. I want you to hear about the miracles, and I want you to believe. That was his focus. And he wants us to have life. Now, I've already talked about the fact that death came into the garden, and that's you've seen this chart before. Death is separation. At essence, it's separation. It's a separation. Spiritual death is a spirit from God. It dies. And, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit from us. That's why the death, that's what death is. Uh, physical death is a separation of a soul from the body, and eternal death is a, pers- is, is God, you know, a person from God for all eternity. And life then is union, not separation. And spiritual life is that Spirit of God now is in us. We are unified with God. Physical life is the soul and the body are still together, and eternal life is when we are with God eternally. That's why wh- we have already started our eternal life. It's already happened. We've crossed over from death to life. We possess eternal life. That is a promise um, of God's word. We've crossed over. Okay, We're already experiencing it, which is why, as the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, take firm hold of the eternal life to which you have been called. We have the eternal life already. So that's where we are at today. Um, Lord, I ask that you would help us grab firmly unto the eternal life which we already have. Thank you for John's accounts of your resurrection from the dead so that we might have faith in your name and possess eternal life. I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.